Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Diamond with only Ground-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Ground-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next Gym Leader or Elite Four's Ace, and finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. The ground type is a really cool one in Diamond and Pearl, with all the fully evolved Pokemon appearing on screen available in the games. In terms of limitations, since our rules state that we can't connect with other games, we won't be able to get trade evolutions, so Golem won't be obtainable, meaning Graveler is the best that we can do there. Steelix is also a trade evolution, however it can be found in the wild as a Steelix, so we'll leave that up there. But there's an interesting situation with that that we'll get to shortly. Rhyperior and Mamoswine's entire evolutionary lines are only available in the post-game unfortunately, and finally, Gliscor's line can only be found by connecting Emerald to the game after obtaining the National deck, so that will also be unavailable. There are some very glaring weaknesses that these Pokémon have, as the secondary typings that they have are not really diverse, unlike a lot of other types, so this should be an interesting challenge. Let's do this. For our starter, we're going to pick one that we can actually use, which is quite a rare thing for these challenges, Turtwig. Because Turtwig doesn't technically have the ground type yet, we'll only be able to use him until our first ground encounter, after which we'll have to wait until we get the experience share to level him up since he can't be sent in battle past that point until he's a ground type. I decide to name him Franklin and... oh my god, he has an adamant nature. That is literally the best possible nature. Surely that has to be a good omen for this run. It's very rare that we get perfect natures. Once we progress through Jubilife City, we run into good old Barry who challenges us to battle. Now this battle can actually be quite tricky. The key is to usually have more than one Pokemon, which we don't have. The reason for this is that he usually spams Growl with Starly, at which point your attack is super low heading into his starter Pokemon and you can't switch. In this battle, he also happened to get a quick attack crit on us, survives just barely in the red, and gets one more off on us to get us below half before his Chimchar comes in. But thankfully, we do level up after the Starly. Our tackles do hardly anything to Chimchar after the Growls, and I thought we would definitely lose this, but Franklin gets a miraculous crit in the nick of time to be able to take him out when one more hit would have ended our run entirely. Good job, Franklin. I'm proud of you. With that, our first Ground-type encounter is officially available since we can now access the Orber Gate, a Geodude. We successfully catch one and nickname it Balboa. I almost went with Rocky, but decided at the last moment to have just a touch of originality. You're welcome. Balboa ends up having a quirky nature, which is neutral, and I'm 100% on board with that. Knowing we have some insane challenges up ahead, I grind Geodude up almost exclusively against Shinx so that we can get attack EVs. Once we're at a sufficient level, we arrive in Orberg City, where we can actually get one more encounter before the first gym, just south in the Orberg Mine. Here, we have just a 2% chance to find Onyx. Now yes, Steelix is available later in the game in the Iron Island, which we can't get otherwise, but we absolutely need Onyx here for a few reasons, but the only one I'll say right now is that Geodude would inevitably overlevel past the level cap on his own, at which point the run would have to end since we have no new encounters for a while afterward. A little unfortunate the way it works out, but this is just one of those many things that makes each type challenge unique. We catch Onyx and name it Dwayne, and Dwayne ends up having a sassy nature, plus special defense and minus speed. Plus special defense is good, but minus speed... Surprisingly enough, speed is one of the only decent stats that Onyx has early game, so that's definitely not great. After some grinding, it's time to take on the Orberg City Gym, a Rock-type gym. Now facing a Rock-type gym with two Pokémon that have Normal and Rock moves would seem like quite a struggle, but in the Orberg Gate, we thankfully get the Rock Smash HM, which we teach both of our Pokémon. Not only does this give us a super effective move, but it also has a chance to lower the opponent's defense too. This makes the trainers in the gym quite manageable, and in no time, it's time for our first gym leader, Rourke. Since Balboa's base attack is nearly double Dwayne's, I decide to lead with him against Rourke's Geodude. To start, I actually decide to use Rock Polish first so that we can outspeed his remaining Pokémon too. Now, as you can imagine, this battle is quite a long process, although the defense drops from Rock Smash help us and we take out Geodude in three attacks after Rourke used a potion and used Stealth Rocks. He switches into Kranidos next, and thanks to the Rock Polish, we now outspeed. Now, his Kranidos is the only Pokémon that has an attack that we don't resist, Pursuit, which does a decent amount of damage on us, but the defense drop from Rock Smash makes him a two-hit KO. Upon level up, Balboa learns Magnitude too. Don't forget that in Hardcore Nuzlocke, Pokémon can level up mid-battle, they just have to be at or below 
below the level cap as the Gym or Elite 4 battle starts. Onyx is his final Pokemon, and since it has Sky High Defense along with Screech and Rock Throw, a crit could very well take us out, so I play it safe and switch into Onyx for the XP as well, and he actually misses Screech upon the switch. Poor guy. With both Pokemon having low attack and 180 base defense, this is a crazy long Rock Snake battle. Alright, that sounds terrible. But Rock Smash of course puts us on top in the end. Without Rock Smash, this battle could have been quite tricky, but we were blessed by the Nuzlocke gods on this one. First badge down, but I am terrified of what's to come. The journey to Floroma goes safely and we make it to the team Galactic Grunts in the meadow who are accosting a poor old honey man. One of them says, hey this kid is a witness, what will we do? And are worried I won't stay quiet. Uh, I don't think battling our Pokemon is gonna help. Honestly, I think the simple solution is just to murder me, guys. Team Galactic's Pokemon are quite easily countered by rock and ground types, so we make it to Commander Mars with little issue. Now, normally this battle is insane for almost all types since her Zubat can learn Toxic, but Onyx actually outspeeds it and we can take it out with two super effective rock throws. Perugly is also ridiculously powerful and has Fake Out and an Orin Berry, but the most it can do to us here is Faint Attack, which isn't Stab anyway, so we breeze through her with super effective Rock Smash, with Dwayne only being brought to about a third. In the route leading towards the turn of forest, we begin to see where our team breaks down though, as we have incredibly close encounters with Pokemon like Piplup and Badu, who both have four times effective moves on us. We barely make it to the forest, and during our double battles with Cheryl, we face two Abras, which I thought would be fine, but they both use hidden power, and both of their hidden power types were super effective against Balboa, and he almost died. Holy sh**. We make it to Eterna City safely though, and upon reaching the name raider, I actually decide to rename Dwayne and have him be called Johnson instead. Since Balboa is named after Rocky's last name, I figured Onyx should be named after Dwayne Johnson's last name. That's all. That's... that's the only reason. With a bit of grinding under our belt, it's time for what I'm fearing the most. The Eterna City Gym, a grass-type gym, a type that is four times effective against both of our Pokémon. Initially, when I was theorycrafting for this run, I was like, well, hey, at least the sturdy ability will help us to survive any moves that would otherwise kill us in one hit, but then I remembered that in Gen 4, sturdy only works on actual one-hit KO moves like Fisher and whatnot. I almost just cancelled my plans to attempt this run at all just on that basis. I can't express how lucky we got against the trainers who I wasn't even sure we could make it through and who you have to battle to get to Gardenia. Johnson having high speed honestly saved us and I basically just had to hope that their Pokemon didn't use a grass attacking move. Thankfully, a lot of them have set up moves like Leech Seed instead so we can hit them once and then outspeed them on the second turn which usually does the job. A single grass attacking move and we would lose a Pokemon. That's what it came down to here aside from just 20 power absorbed from Badu. We grind to the level cap where Balboa learns Rollout at level 22 and it's time for what I've been dreading all along, Gardenia. She starts the battle with a Cheruby, and I decide to lead with Johnson. Not only are we dealing with four times effective types here, but her Cheruby, Turtwig, and Roserade also happen to have Grass Knot, which increases power the heavier the opponent is. Great. After having to wipe to the start of the game a few times already, I've learned that Sandstorm is absolutely necessary for Balboa to survive a Grass Knot since it increases the special defense of Rock types and he's much lighter than Onyx, so I'm forced to set up that right away. Then she goes for Grass Knot on her very first turn and one hit KOs Johnson immediately. Her AI seems to be somewhat random in its approach, sometimes opting for Leech Seed, Safeguard, or Growth, but that was brutal. With absolutely zero hope left, I send in Balboa and try to execute what is left of my strategy. The key here is that Roserade is incredibly fast and will immediately take us down with Grass Knot, so I decide to use Rock Polish, after which Cheruby goes for Growth. What I've noticed, especially in Gen 4 and Gen 5, is that the AI tend to match your status boosting moves with their own, but not always. I go for Rock Polish again, and Cheruby goes for Leech Seed this time, getting some recovery and hurting us a bit. It's too risky to go for a third Rock Polish, so now it's time to execute. I go for Rollout, and Cheruby just goes for Safeguard. Without the growth, we would have lived the Grass Knot here due to the Sandstorm boost, but the Leech Seed would still take us out, so that was a lifesaver. We hit it with Rollout again, but my calcs were just off and it lives with just a sliver, but it uses growth yet again. Oh my god. But then, Gardenia uses a Super Potion to full health, but another Rollout is able to take it down nonetheless. Whew. 
Now, rollout is only 90% accuracy, and if it misses, the increase in damage is cancelled out, and she sends in her Roserade next. Now, the speed here is incredibly close since we're at plus 4 after 2 boosts, but it looks like the level up saved us as we outspeed, and it's enough to take it down. No way. As scary as that was, I'm actually glad she sent out Roserade first since it has slightly lower defense and HP than Turtwig does, who comes out next. We have one last rollout in our chain of five here, it just needs to hit, and it does, and it takes it out. We just beat Gardenia with two Pokemon who were four times weak to every single one of her Pokemon and without access to Sturdy as it operates in later gens. Rock Polish and Rollout was an incredible combination. We just had to pull them off, which was incredibly difficult. It took four wipes after all. Onyx setting up the Sandstorm wasn't entirely necessary it seems, but it was a safeguard that we had to have active in case the Cherubi used Grass Knot on Geodude on the first turn. His sacrifice will not be forgotten. Perhaps more than any battle we've had in our challenges, this one I thought was impossible, with an instant one-hit KO move on all of her Pokemon on the face of it, and they outspeed without boost too. Wow, let's go. On our way to Veilstone, we arrive at the Wayward Cave, and there is a secret entrance under the bridge where we could get one of our encounters, however, it's blocked off by strength. Damn, so close yet so far. We'll be back. Along the way, Balboa attempts to evolve, but I'm going to wait until level 29 to let him, as that's when he learns Earthquake earlier than after evolution, and it will be before the next gym too, which has a level cap of 30. Now we do have a major problem here, that Geodude is our only Pokemon, and there's a long stretch to the next gym, meaning the level cap is a problem. However, we've now seen enough Pokemon that we can get the experience share, which we can attach to our HM Pokemon to split the experience load. Even still, we need to avoid trainers as much as possible, and I devised some sneaky strategies to do so. After arriving in Heart Home City, Fantina says that we're not strong enough to battle her yet. What, is our lone Geodude not good enough for you? <laughs> While trying to leave, we encounter Barry, and this battle never fails to surprise me. I always forget about it. He leads with Starly, and with only one Pokemon, I realize our only option is our rollout strategy. I go for Rock Polish since I'm like, eh, his Starly can't do anything to us, and he hits us with Endeavor, which actually does do a bit of damage. Thankfully, we get a crit on our first rollout to take him down. In comes Rosalia, and I'm like, uh-oh, not good. Rollout doesn't KO, but Rosalia just goes for Leech Seed so we can take it out on our next one. Monferno comes in next and outspeeds us because it has priority Mach Punch, and he brings us to just 20 HP before we take him down. His final Pokemon is Buizel, and I'm like, oh no, a priority 4 times effective Aqua Jet will do us in, and he does move first, but thankfully it was just priority Quick Attack instead. Not gonna lie, my heart skipped a beat there, but we scraped by. After this battle, the gate to Route 209 is now open and our savior has arrived. This guy on the bridge who gives us the good rod, which opens up a new encounter for us. If we fish here on Route 208, we can actually find a barboach, which finally gives us an answer to water types at least. We catch one and name it Catfish, and it has a quiet nature, plus special attack and minus speed. Pretty brutal, but after operating with just a Geodude for a while, I can't complain. Shortly after this, Geodude ends up learning Earthquake at level 29, at which point we can finally let him evolve into a beastly Graveler. With that, we arrive in Veilstone City, the location of our next gym battle, but first, I notice that Route 214 is actually open to us, meaning another encounter is possible. In this Ruin Maniac cave here, we can not only find the Dig TM, but also a new encounter, Hippopotas, which is a 5% chance to encounter in here. And interestingly, the chance of finding Hippopotas increases as you catch more and more unknown. Weird. We catch one, a female, which is pretty cool since I like the color variation a lot, so we name it Big Mama. Big Mama ends up having a mild nature, plus special attack and minus defense. Honestly, it's hard to imagine a worse nature than that. But at least we get Automatic Sandstorm now with its ability. Towards the end of this route, there's a guy with three Rosalia who's hard to get by, so I think that's as far as I'm willing to go. It's time for the fighting type Veilstone Gym, and with our two new encounters, I'm not feeling terrible about this one. With that being said, the trainers are a bit of a struggle as Graveler just can't be sent in at all due to its fighting weakness, and aside from that, we have two unevolved Pokemon. Along the way though, Catfish ends up evolving into a Whiskash, which should be a great help. It's time for Gym Leader Maylene. Maylene starts with a Metatite, and I lead with Big Mama to get the Sandstorm up. She goes for Drain Punch right away, which does about a fifth, then Takedown brings her below half. She then uses Confusion to about half, after which Takedown, well, takes her down. Recoil brings us below half, but our Orenberry brings us back above. Machoke comes out next, and it outspeeds and hits us with Brick Break to just 19 HP, after which we land a Yawn, since I know Big Mama can't do much against it, and Takedown Recoil is not a good thing at this point. 
Since Machoke will be asleep at the end of next turn, I'm forced to switch into Balboa to tank a Brick Break to below half since we need to conserve Catfish for Lucario who would destroy Graveler. Rock Polish could be possible here with super effective Earthquake on Lucario, but we'd need two to outspeed and that's too risky because Machoke could just wake up and take us out immediately. So I switch into Catfish here. Machoke stays asleep on the switch and I go for Mud Shot in the hopes that we might lower his accuracy, followed by a Water Pulse and he stays asleep anyway to take him down. Lucario is sent in and he goes for Drain Punch for about a third, then we use Magnitude, but we only get Magnitude 5 so it doesn't do much at all. She then goes for Force Palm, which brings us down to a third. Our Orenberry activates, then we get a Magnitude 8 to take it down. Wow, if we had gotten a lower roll there, Lucario could have swept our entire team with ease, as our team was absolutely hammered by her. That was close. Ironically enough, on our way to Pastoria, we have to pass the Rosalia guy, and it turns out he can't see two feet in front of him, apparently, as we can get by even though he looks right at us. I guess you have to be right beside him. He likes physical contact. Now a huge problem arises here. The level cap for Wake is also 30, just like Maylene, and all of our Pokemon are already there. Thankfully, we're saved by the Great Marsh where we can get our next encounter, and it ends up being a Wooper, which we catch and nickname Dopey. Dopey has a careful nature, plus special defense and minus special attack, which is actually quite great. We also pick up the Toxic TM, which I'm gonna hold on to for now, as we will have a couple good options for using it. Thankfully, Dopey actually evolves the very next level, so we have a beautifully derpy Quagsire on our team now. Now a small problem is that we can basically only use Dopey against the gym trainers, but the typing works out and he manages them all pretty well. Gym Leader Wake himself is a bit scary as a water type trainer as Graveler is going to be useless, Hippopotas is also weak to water, and we only have water and ground types otherwise. Wake leads with Gyarados and I actually lead with Big Mama to get the Sandstorm going immediately and to take the Intimidate which is brutal for our team. Gyarados hits us with Dragon Rage to about half, after which I hit him with Yawn as this Gyarados is a massive threat. Here I switch into Dopey to tank whatever he goes for and it ends up being Brine which doesn't do much at all. So far so good as Gyarados falls asleep. Here I go for Amnesia to raise our special defense while we can as Brine does double damage once we're below half health so we'll have to watch for that. Gyarados stays asleep as I go for Slam which brings him to just below half after Sandstorm damage. Knowing our next Slam will likely bring him into Potion range, I go for Amnesia instead to stall for more Sandstorm damage, but Wake goes for a Super Potion nonetheless when his Gyarados was like above a third, after which our Slam misses. Gyarados then wakes up and goes for Swagger to confuse us, but our attack is raised. We then hit ourselves in confusion immediately, then Brian gets a crit to bring us to 21 HP, after which our Berry helps and we hit him with Slam to a quarter. Absolutely terrible luck. Gyarados then goes for Swagger again, but we break through Confusion to take him down. That was insane. Wake sends out his own Quagsire next, and we hit ourselves in Confusion immediately for way more damage than I thought it might do, but thankfully he just goes for Tail Whip. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Balboa since his Quagsire doesn't have any water moves. From here, we're able to take him down with three Earthquakes after he potions. In comes Floatzel, and this is a scary situation. I switch in Catfish, who tanks Brine well, then we hit him with Magnitude 9 for huge damage, then Brine brings us to just above half. So thankfully, it won't do double damage on the next turn, but our next Magnitude is only a 6. So it brings him into the red, and Brine now brings us to 34 HP, and Sandstorm just barely doesn't kill him. We have no other choice but to go for it and our Quick Claw activates so we can take him out. Unbelievable. That was a good chance for us to get punished, but it didn't happen. Four badges down by the skin of our teeth. With the level cap now at 36, that means we can officially bring Turtwig onto the team and start leveling him up with the experience share. While grinding, he gets to level 18 where he evolves into a Grottle. So close yet so far. After Cynthia gives us the secret potion, we spray the group of Psyducks blocking our path. I'm pretty sure this is just Mace. Once we reach Celestic Town, we meet an old lady who is worried that Team Plasma is going to bomb the city. Uh, we should probably get out of here then. I mean, this place is already a giant crater. During our grinding adventure, Dopey learns Earthquake, a fantastic stab move for him, and we also get the Black Glasses. This is a great item for Big Mama in particular, as she recently learned Crunch, and that's great for the gym that we have coming up next. As it turns out, this plan works quite well, as the Ghost-type trainers are taken down quite handily. In the process, Big Mama ends up evolving into a beastly Hippowdon. I was initially going to wait until the level 37 mark for Earthquake a bit earlier, but the level cap is 36, and I know we could probably use the extra bulk and power for Fantina. 
I also decide to put Toxic on Quagsire, figuring he gets the least diverse move pool of our water and ground types. After painstakingly grinding to the level cap, Franklin's experience share completes its job as he hits level 32 and evolves into a beastly adamant Torterra, which we can finally use. Amazing. With that, and with me being sick of grinding, it's time for our fifth gym leader. Fantina leads with a Drift Blim, and unfortunately we're kind of stuck with Rollout on Balboa since Rock Smash can't be deleted until Cantilave City, and that won't suffice since Miss Magius could just come in with Magical Leaf while we're locked in. So instead, I decide to lead with Quagsire to try and stall out Drift Blim with Toxic, especially since it has Minimize 2, which could prove troublesome. Our Toxic hits, and unfortunately Dopey doesn't have any actual offensive moves that can hit Drift Blim, so we're stuck with spamming Amnesia while its health dwindles. Drift Blim does get a crit on Gus to take us below half eventually, but our Citrus Berry helps recover us, and after she uses a Hyper Potion, we're able to wear it down all the way with us slightly under half. Miss Magius comes out next, and my calcs tell me that with our max special defense after all the Amnesias, we can live one 4 times effective Magical Leaf, and we do on just 23 HP and can hit it with Toxic too. I'm forced to switch here, so I go into Hippowdon to start the Sandstorm, and we get hit by Shadow Ball to above half, but she got the special defense drop. Oh, that is brutal. Without that, we could have ended this right now with Crunch, since Magical Leaf does the same, if not less than Shadow Ball, according to my calcs. I'm now forced to switch here because of that drop, so I go into Franklin. Now Franklin, I didn't level up fully because, frankly, I couldn't take any more grinding and knew there was nothing more that those levels would really give us, and Magical Leaf does effectively nothing to us. I go for Razor Leaf, which combined with Toxic and Sandstorm would easily kill, she goes for Shadow Ball, and gets a crit to take Franklin down immediately. Are you kidding me? I did the calcs too, and it still easily would have KO'd us if we were level 36, so that wasn't a factor. It was just sheer dumb luck with that special defense drop on Big Mama, followed by a crit on Franklin, both of whom could have taken her out easily. I switch back into Big Mama, who does indeed survive the Magical Leaf, then takes her out with Crunch. Gengar comes out, and a switch into Balboa is able to handle it after some confusion nonsense since it's a physical Gengar for some reason. Man, that adamant Torterra loss was brutal, but we made it through. Five badges. Now that we can use Surf, I make sure to pick up the Sea Incense on Route 204 to power up Catfish's water moves, after which we can finally Surf to Cantilave City. But before that, on the opposite side of the lake from Jubilife, we can get a new encounter, a Gastrodon. Since Shellos is only water type, we haven't been able to use one of these until now, so this is great. We successfully catch one and name it Eugene, and it ends up having a bold nature, plus defense and minus attack, and has the Storm Drain ability too. That's a damn good Gastrodon right there. Before taking on the Cantilave City Gym, we have another rival battle with Barry, and since his Starly has now evolved, it has Intimidate with Double Team 2, so Rollout was not a viable option this time. Thankfully, Eugene is now a great option to take down Staravia since he's primarily a special attacker. Big Mama luckily gets a crit on Rosalia with Crunch to take it out after being put to sleep and hit by Giga Drain, and she even gets hit by a crit pursuit on the way out back to Eugene from Buizel, who's now an easy KO since we have water and ground types. Eugene also gets hit by a crit by Heracross's Night Slash, so we switch into Catfish to finish him off after being brought to just 37 HP from Brick Break, and Monferno is an easy task for Dopey to handle. It seems we're fine finally getting a touch of type coverage to handle Barry's team, which is otherwise quite well-rounded. The Cantilave Gym being a Steel-type gym is quite easy, especially with special water attackers like Eugene for many Steelixes. Byron himself is a savage. I mean, he literally says, you've beaten my son, but that's no surprise. His battle is a bit tricky in that he starts with a Bronzor with Levitate. So I lead with Hippowdon since I know we'll need Gastrodon later to avoid having it hit by Hypnosis or Confuse Ray. We take down the Bronzor with a few crunches, switch into Eugene for Steelix and start Rain Dance to avoid giving his Bastiodon a special defense raise with the Sandstorm, and then take down the Steelix and Bastiodon with a Rain Boosted Surf each for the win. A nice break for sure. With our 6th badge in hand, we can now utilize Strength, meaning we can head back to the Wayward Cave's secret entrance for our final encounter, a Gibble, which is a 15% chance to be found in the basement. We catch one and nickname it Shredder, and it ends up having a relaxed nature which is plus defense and minus speed. Minus speed on a future Garchomp is definitely terrible, but it'll be a Garchomp at least. Down here we can also find something almost equally exciting, the Earthquake TM, which will definitely be useful soon. After taking on the commanders at their respective lakes, who are again quite manageable, with ground types, we also pick up the soft sand item from the underground of Mount Coronet and have Shredder evolve on the way through the snowy route 216. After a ton of grinding through routes 216 and 217, we reach Snowpoint City where it's time for our seventh gym battle. Now Candace's team is absolutely terrifying for us. 
Grass is four times effective on four of our Pokemon, regularly super effective on another, and Ice is four times effective on one and regularly super effective on two others. This is disastrous. I spent forever thinking about how we could approach this with tons of ideas like trying to use Sunny Day combined with Flamethrower on Gabite, with a Yachi Berry taken from a Starly with Thief, but Obama Snow's Snow Warning would mess that up, and I thought about a rollout strategy with Graveler, but Sneasel would still outspeed even assuming we could get two Rock Polishes off, and if Obama Snow is sent out second, then that's the end of that. But eventually, I came up with the best strategy I had, if you can call it that, and went for it. Candace starts with Snover, and I lead with Gabite. Dangerous, I know, but with Flamethrower, we're able to one-hit KO it right off the bat. In comes Sneasel next, and unfortunately my calcs tell me that Flamethrower won't KO. In terms of ice moves, Sneasel only has Avalanche, which is negative priority, but it does do double damage if it's hit, so needless to say, we have to switch. I go into Gastrodon, and Sneasel actually went for Slash, oddly enough, but that was impossible to predict. I hit it with Surf after it just went for Taunt, and it does about 3 quarters. On the next turn, Candace actually preemptively switches directly into a Bomba Snow, which surprised me, but that's actually kind of helpful for my plan, as now we have about a fifth damage on a Bomba Snow. Here, I switch into Big Mama to tank the predicted Wood Hammer and cancel out the Snow in favor of the Sandstorm, but a Bomba Snow actually goes for Avalanche instead. It's risky, but I have to go for Yawn here because I need to put this thing to sleep, but Obama Snow outspeeds us and hits us with Grass Whistle to put us to sleep. Uh-oh. I decide to stay in and she uses Avalanche again, which brings us to 38 HP. I need to switch out here, but nothing is a good option as nothing would survive the Wood Hammer. But upon switching into Dopey, she goes for Swagger instead. Knowing there's nothing I can do, I go for Toxic, she misses her Grass Whistle, and we land it. Oof. Obama Snow's Citrus Berry activates though, but now the combination of Toxic and Sandstorm should help us a bit. I stay in and go for Slam, and it brings her to about a quarter, after which she just uses Avalanche. Obama Snow just barely survives after Poison and Sandstorm damage though, and now I know we're in KO range, but I figure she'll use a Hyper Potion, which she does, and Dopey hits himself in confusion down to just 23 HP. Now that she has higher health, I figure she'll probably try to go for the Wood Hammer since she can now survive the recoil, so I make the incredibly risky decision to switch into Gabite, and she does, and we survive on just 37 HP, she gets a ton of recoil from the hit combined with Toxic and Sandstorm, so we can outspeed and take it down with Flamethrower. That was absolutely ridiculous. In comes Sneasel, and basically any attack will take us out, so I send in Eugene, and she just goes for Taunt so we can take it out with Surf on the next turn, with below half remaining. Her last Pokemon is Metacham, and I know we can survive one hit, so I use Surf, she hits us down to 34 HP with Force Palm first, and then we bring her down to about a third. Here I'm forced to switch, so I send in Catfish, who tanks an Ice Punch, and we can get the final KO with Surf. Unbelievable. Half sheer dumb luck and half adaptation, I would say. That was a wild battle all around, but we pulled through Deathless somehow. After managing Cyrus and Saturn relatively well at the Galactic HQ, it's time for the Spear Pillar. The double battle with the commanders goes well thanks to our typing advantage, and it's time for the battle that always scares me, the final battle with Cyrus. Now one of the main problems with this battle is that you need some HMs to get here, so you're usually stuck up here with an HM Mon, but I said f*** it and put Rock Climb on Graveler. After studying Cyrus's team for a while, it's time. I lead with Hippowdon as he leads with Honchkrow. I know I need to get up Sandstorm, and I had also taught Hippowdon Stealth Rock for this battle too, since all of his Pokemon are flying type, so I lead with that after he hits us with Drill Pack for about a third. I also taught Hippowdon Rock Slide, which we found on the way here, and Big Mama gets brought below half as Honchkrow barely survives in the red. Thankfully, Cyrus just uses a potion though, so we can take it out with another. In comes Gyarados, a scary threat for us at this point. After Intimidate and with Aqua Tail, we can't stay in, so I switch into Dopey. I need to get a Toxic off on this thing, and thankfully we do after being brought to just 19 HP after Giga Impact of all things. Holy sh**. With both Toxic and Sandstorm doing their thing, I switch into Catfish, and because of the Giga Impact, Yurtos has to recharge, so we got a free switch. This way, after getting hit by an Ice Fang, I can take him down with a Surf after the Sandstorm and Toxic damage buildup. Or not. He survives on like 1 HP and hits us with Giga Impact for good measure, bringing us down to just 24 HP before going down. In comes Weavile, and I am terrified of this thing as it has super effective moves on a lot of our team, is ridiculously fast, and we're already so weak. I'm forced to switch into Eugene, and he uses X Scissor, which does about a third. He goes for X Scissor again for some reason, but then our Surf doesn't take him down and his Citrus Berry activates. Oh no. 
At this point, I sincerely thought the run was over. He can Night Slash, Brick Break, or Ice Punch everything on our team to death from here. So I just click Surf, and he goes for x Scissor yet again. I have no idea why. Eugene survives on just 16 HP and barely KOs him with Surf. What in the world? His last Pokemon is Crobat, and I switch into Balboa, who's able to handle him quite handily with a few rock climbs after getting taken down to about half, thanks to no confusion or air slash flinches. I sincerely can't fathom how we came out of this and Candace's battle deathless. The stars have truly aligned. On the way to Sunny Shore City, we... Stop it. Get some help. We also check around in the grass and... Oh, damn. Sorry, Eugene, but that Gastrodon is sexier. I still love you, though. With that, we arrive in Sunny Shore City and head straight for the gym to help train our Pokemon up against the trainers. During the process, Shredder finally evolves into a beastly Garchomp at level 48, just before the level cap of 49. After grinding up, it's time for the final gym leader, Volkner, an Electric-type trainer. I don't think I need to go too in-depth for this battle. I mean, we have a ground team after all. One thing we really needed to be careful of was his Octillery, though, which has ice and grass moves, which could sweep most of our team. But I put a Yachi Berry on Garchomp, which we stole from a Starly using Thief, so we can tank it and KO it. And the rest of his Pokemon are all Electric types and go down to our ground moves. Eight badges acquired. After the battle, Jasmine, the Olivine City gym leader in Johto, gives us Waterfall, which is a fantastic move for Dopey. It's also really cool to see her here. This was a great tribute. After our trek through Victory Road, we encounter Barry for the last time at the Pokemon League. This battle would have been more manageable, except I still had our HMB barrel on the team from Victory Road, so we didn't have Hippowdon when we really needed her. We luckily scraped by with our team absolutely demolished at the end, but luckily we had just the right amount of pivots and power to take down the threats that hurt our team like Snorlax, Heracross, and Infernape. Unreal. After a ton of grinding and preparations, perhaps most importantly getting Swords Dance from the Veilstone Game Corner, picking up items like the Wise Glasses, Earth Plate, etc., and fulfilling the rest of our EVs, it's time for the Elite Four. For the level cap, I'm using 60, as every single Pokemon in the Elite Four is 60 or below, except for Lucian's one level 63 Bronzong, so I think it's a fair cap, especially since we'll be leveling up before his battle. First up is Aaron, the Bug-type Elite Four member. He leads with a Dustox, and I decide to send Big Mama out first. This way, I can set up Stealth Rocks right away, which are four times effective against two of his Pokemon, and can also get the Sandstorm started for chip damage. Dustox double teams right away though, which is concerning, but low accuracy Rock Slide hits nonetheless. Nonetheless, after he hits us with a Bug Buzz, leaves him with just a sliver, but the Sandstorm finishes him off. Beautifly comes out next, and this is why we couldn't lead with a Water and Ground type. It has Energy Ball after all, but Stealth Rock does half damage on it, it hits us with Shadow Ball, then four times effective Rock Slide demolishes it. In comes Drapion next, who brings us to half with Aerial Ace, but Earthquake is a one-hit KO. Next is Heracross, and a crit close combat would definitely take us down, so I switch into Eugene, who tanks it, and the subsequent Night Slash, then is able to one-hit KO with a Wise Glasses boosted Surf because of its special defense drop. His last Pokemon is Vespaquin, who gets wrecked by Stealth Rocks and then Surf. Ultimately, Hippowdon was a great lead choice there, and we handled that quite well. Next up is Bertha, our ground-type Arch Nemesis. Charging up Swords Dance Garchomp would be possible here, however, her Quagsire lead could spam Double Team, which could get messy. And Big Mama's Sandstorm would actually help her Rock types, so I lead with Catfish instead. Earthquake does about a third, then as predicted, since Quagsire only has Dig, I can hit her with a double power Earthquake while she is underground to take her out. Sudowoodo is then an easy KO with Surf, and the same goes for Golem too. She sends out her own Hippowdon next, and Surf brings it to a sliver, after which its Citrus Berry activates and it misses its Stone Edge so we can KO it with another. Poor Bertha. Her final Pokemon is a Whiskash, and we have an ultimate Whisker battle as ours emerges victorious. The third Elite Four member is Flint, the Fire-type Elite Four member, with a majority of his Pokemon not being the Fire-type. Now this is a good opportunity for Shredder, especially since he has a Rapidash with Sunny Day and Solar Beam, which is quite terrifying for us. He leads with Rapidash, and we charge up with Swords Dance on the first turn. He then uses Bounce, so while he's in the sky, we might as well charge up another, although we do risk Paralysis on Bounce, so I use Earthquake on the next turn for the KO. He then sends out Infernape, which is a bit troublesome since it should outspeed, but he goes for the relatively weak Mach Punch, which doesn't do much, and then gets taken out by Earthquake. The same goes for his Low Punny, and then he sends out his Driplin. 
Now Drift Blend we have to be a bit careful about since it has the Aftermath ability and our Quagsire's Damp ability would actually be able to cancel that out but we risk it spamming Double Team in the process so I just go for it and we take it out with Dragon Claw and are left with 94 HP. Steelix is his final Pokemon and it's a range to kill with Earthquake at plus 2 but thankfully we get a good roll and one hit KO in. Solid. The final Elite Four member is Lucian and he's one that I'm quite worried about. Setting up here with Garchomp is possible, but Mr. Mime with Reflect and Psychic could do a good chunk on us, and Alakazam could then outspeed and KO Shredder. So I leave with Big Mama instead with the Black Glasses and Crunch so we can at least get the Sandstorm going. Mr. Mime goes for Reflect right away, which is unfortunate, and that allows it to survive a Crunch. It then hits us hard with Psychic before we can take it down. Medicham comes in next, which does have Ice Punch too, but I know we can tank one, so I go for Earthquake, and he actually goes for Drain Punch to bring us to 90 HP, and Earthquake does less than half. I have to switch here, so I go into Eugene, who takes a Drain Punch to about a third. Eugene is great here, since he can bypass Reflect with special moves, so after taking an Ice Punch... Oh... We got frozen by Ice Punch immediately. Not good. I decide to risk it and try going for a Surf to stall out the Reflect, but we don't thaw out and are left in the red. I switch into Dopey here, who gets hit by Fire Punch, but thankfully no burn. He crits us with Fire Punch, unfortunately, but no burn. Earthquake just barely doesn't KO, but the Sandstorm finishes the job. In comes Alakazam next, and this thing is trouble. Dopey is too low, and I'm assuming this thing is going to try an Energy Ball, so I switch into Shredder, and he does indeed, but our Sand Veil ability in the Sandstorm causes him to miss. Clutch. He then outspeeds and uses Psychic to below half, then Earthquake is able to finish him off. Giraffe Rake is next, and a Psychic would be dangerous for us, and Earthquake isn't a guaranteed KO, so I switch into Catfish, who tanks the incoming Crunch well, and two-hit KOs it with Earthquake after he brings us to 73 HP. His final Pokemon is Bronzong, and I go for Amnesia, thinking he'll use Psychic, but he goes for Gyro Ball instead. We hit him with Surf for a bit less than half, and another Gyro Ball brings us to 37 HP. Here, since we outspeed, I decide to use Rest to heal us, but we fail to wake up over the next few turns and are brought too low, so I'm forced to switch. I go into Dopey, who's a very slow Pokemon, so Gyro Ball doesn't do much on us, after which a few waterfalls bring him low, but his Citrus Berry activates and we're brought to just 36 HP in the process. With both Bronzong and Dopey at a sliver, I know Lucian's gonna full restore, so I switch into Big Mama. We get a crit on our first crunch to bring him below half, then he just uses Calm Mind three times in a row so we can take him out with a few more. Our team was super badly damaged after this, but with the Elite Four down, there's only one challenge remaining, the champion, Cynthia. Cynthia's team is obviously ridiculously powerful, and there's no surefire strategy for beating her. We just have to try and play well. Right before the battle, I realized I made a noob mistake and forgot to get the Ice Beam TM for Gastrodon, so, uh, yeah. Big yikes. She leads with a Spiritomb, and I decide to leave with Dopey. Big Mama would have been good, but three of her Pokemon are immune to Sandstorm, and her Garchomp Sand Veil ability wouldn't be a good thing to activate. Since Spiritomb can kind of be hard to take down, I go for Toxic first, and a few Earthquakes are able to take her down as we get brought below half. She sends in Roserade next, which is obviously a massive threat for our team with Energy Ball. Thankfully, we have one Pokemon who isn't weak to grass, Shredder, so I send her out, but she went for Shadow Ball instead for about a quarter, but no special defense drop, thankfully. Here, I decide to take the opportunity to Swords Dance, and Roserade goes for Sludge Bomb to bring us to above half, and it poisons us. Not good. Earthquake is then able to take it down, though. Next, she brings in her own Garchomp. Now my calcs tell me that her Garchomp is one singular stat point faster than ours, which is absolutely crucial. But in reality, there's nothing much I can do here. Garchomp's already weak and poisoned, I just have to hope that she misses the Dragon Rush, but she goes for Brick Break on us to bring us to just 14 HP, after which a Swords Dance boosted Dragon Claw can take it out, then the poison takes Shredder down. What a sacrifice. Now a Water and Ground type is a decent counter to a remaining Pokemon, so I send in Catfish next, and she sends in Lucario. It hits us with Dragon Pulse for about a third, then Earthquake brings it down to the red. So close. She then full restores, we hit it with Earthquake to the red again, she hits us with Aura Sphere all the way down to 34 HP, but then we can KO it. Gastrodon comes out next, and I switch in our own Gastrodon to assert dominance. After a lengthy exchange, I wrote down a lengthy mating session in my notes here. Why? Just why? 
We take it down with a few mud bombs after we both lowered each other's accuracy and we got a crit on our last attack so we live with 95 HP. In comes her final Pokemon, Milotic, and at this point I have no idea how we're going to handle this thing as our team is not looking good. And our only full health Pokemon are both weak to water. I decide to just go for the Mud Bomb to try and get the accuracy drop, but she gets a crit ice beam to take us out immediately. Rest in peace Eugene, you absolute legend. I send in Dopey next, and as great as Toxic might seem, it would activate Milotic's Marble Scale ability and increase its defense hugely which wouldn't be good for late battle. She hits us with an Ice Beam to 21 HP and Earthquake does less than half, after which she uses Aqua Ring and another Earthquake brings her really low. I have no other choice from here, I have to let Dopey go to an Ice Beam. From here, with Milotic at a quarter after its recovery, I send in Big Mama who's able to outspeed somehow and take it down with an Earthquake. Amazing, I think that means she tried to go for Mirror Coat oddly enough which has negative priority. My calcs tell me she would have only done around 92% with Surf anyway. A weird ending, but we did it with only 3 Pokemon left. God, our remaining team is so derpy. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Diamond with only ground types and they were really fun to use. It was an incredibly difficult early game and then we picked up momentum straight until Cynthia basically. If you enjoyed the run, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community and we are very close to 100k. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like down below to help it out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.